Uh, right, I think now it is time to pass over to the audience. I think we've got John out yes. there. John, give yes, us a wave. Just, just along here. <laughs> okay, how would you like to wave? First hand up, or how would you want to... Entirely up to you, John. Whoever okay. seems most attractive. This gen uh, yeah. Most attractive? I'll... Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> um, well, we're stuffed. You're first. <laughs> Quick question. How do you deal with what I would term gits? How do I deal with... Gits. Gits? Yeah. Pe people like me who want to actually come along to your show, work out how you do it, and then actually trick you back and try and sort of uh, mess up the trick. Oh, I see. How, how, do you, how do you deal with people who... Um, I mean, have all of your effects got... Uh, a get out and, and a, how do you cope with those kind of people uh, like so, me? Well, to be honest, yeah, to be honest, it doesn't it doesn't really happen. I think they're not not really sort of on stage. I think you have to be completely in control on stage, um, otherwise it's just not going to work anyway. So that doesn't quite arise. But I mean, there are certainly some things that it's important to me to get somebody up who's going to challenge me. So sometimes I look I look for the person that's kind of you know sat a bit like that and is clearly going to be tough because n not because it makes them tough on stage because I can still uh, well, it just makes them kind of um, it's that weird thing of you know if you, if you if you ask someone to think of a letter of the alphabet and they're playing fairly then there's a one in 26 chance of getting it right but if they say go on try it on me I bet you can't do it you know they're thinking of Q or Z so now it's only one in two so it's easier to work with somebody there who's trying to catch you out yeah so it's the same thing so sometimes on stage sometimes that that kind of attitude of trying to catch up can actually be very, very helpful because it just makes people far more predictable. So um, I don't consider it a bad thing at all. It's just using whatever people bring you and making sure you get to where you want to go. Okay, one second. Okay, this gentleman just here on the end. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I noticed in your paintings uh, that sometimes um, they're quite monotone and flat uh, in terms of colour use. And yeah. sometimes you're quite... Oh, you're a, you're a portrait artist as well, aren't you? Yes, we spoke oh, when you were signing. I'm impressed yeah. with your memory. That's right. Um, so I was wondering, is there a rationale that you use? For instance, I noticed that some of your later pieces, um, you've had your um, subject uh, in front of you and you've taken the pictures yourselves, yet you've still painted them uh, with quite muted colours. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I think it just depends on the subject. I think it's, it's on the subject you're painting. I, I think uh, some people lend themselves to kind of brighter colours. Some people... Uh, just done one of a pianist called James Rhodes, who always wears black and white, got sort of dark hair, quite sort of pale face, and it, it, something like that would make sense to paint in a muted way. I think you just have to take it from the from the person you're painting. Yes, I take photographs myself because you know, having come from a tradition of painting celebs, I didn't have them, you know, weirdly because I know a few now, but at the time I didn't, so I wasn't able to do it from life. And because it, it is a solitary thing for me, I'd much rather take the pictures myself and then paint from a series of photographs that I've taken. It just suits me more. So. Um, uh, and then as I'm kind of getting the pictures just right, often I'll just play around a bit with those sorts of colour values and things there just to sort of see what kind of seems to fit the picture. But, um, yeah, there's no particular rhyme or reason. You just have to take it from what the subject, see, what seems to sit well with, with him or her. We Thank found you. somebody attractive at last. Who we are? Oh, thank God! <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, um, I was wondering, you, you talked a lot during your show about um, psychology and... Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? You're just about, yeah. Can you speak uh, okay, up a little okay, bit? Thank sorry. you. Yeah. Um, you talked about um, just statistics and psychology and, and you know, that there's, there's no such thing as psychic ability, that you don't consider yourself to have any psychic ability. And then you told somebody that they had three kidneys. Yep. So it kind of threw me a bit. Because, I mean, with all the behavioural psychology yeah. knowledge in the world, you can't diagnose somebody with three kidneys from 200 foot across the, the cinema, cinema, theatre. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you're going to give us any insight into that <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of, that's sort of the point, isn't it? That is, you know, and I think um, uh, what I do when I say those things are very honest. You know, I don't, I don't have psychic ability and no one's playing along and it's not studios and all the rest of it. Um, but then you still have to try and create... You know, it's trying to find a balance between creating, a f creating the kind of the feeling of amazement or wonder, or what you're trying to do as your job as some sort of magician. But at the same point, just going, look, I'm not one of those people that will put you in touch with your dead relatives, and I, you know, I'm not psychic. And, and if you can look at this and go, well, if he can do that and he's not psychic, then hopefully you, people might then look at the psychics that are doing things that often aren't as impressive. Um, <laughs> that's an awful thing to say, but. Um, Sadly, it's true. When you go and see a psychic do a show as opposed to an edited version on TV, it's just dire a lot of the time. Um, and, uh, and no, well, maybe they don't have to be psychic as well. So, um, but yes, and also, you know, that is, that is something based on acts that used to happen in the, uh, back in the 30s. And it's, um, it's, 
it, it, but I suppose that's hopefully what I, leave, what I would want to leave somebody with, is them going, okay, it's possible to do that without any recourse to a supernatural technique. So that's enough to hopefully just have in the back of your mind without needing to, well, it's nice, of course, to, I'm sure you do want to know how it's done, but um, the important thing for me is that it can be done without needing to be psychic at all on, on, on any level. And that, 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 that's, that's important because I think it's, you know, uh, Douglas Adams had a thing about, um, you know, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it enough to know that the garden's beautiful without needing to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it? And I think that, you know, in this world at the moment where we have all this sort of psychic stuff and people saying, yes, you've got to be open-minded, which means supposedly you seem to be believing anything, um, I think it's enough sometimes. And I think to know that we as human beings can create things that, you know, for, for me, the, this, the psychological explanation of why a psychic might work, why you might listen to a psychic tell you something and think, oh, that's me they're talking about. The reason why that's happening is because you're making it fit, because we are pattern finding animals. So when they say things that are actually a little bit general or very specific, but you'll find somewhere where you can make it fit, the fact you do that, the fact we do that as human beings and make those things fit, or the fact that a magician can stand on stage and do something that fools you into thinking that something supernatural must be happening, those are all human processes, and to me, that's always going to be much more beautiful and, and resonant than the psychic explanation, because it says something about us, about us as human beings, and to me, that always has to be the more fascinating explanation, because it's the real one. Obviously, the, the brain is you know, a very powerful tool, and, uh, and a lot of what you do is kind of getting a, a reaction out of people, but also, like, to create something within them. I mean, the, the whole idea of the trick-or-treat was to kind of help people with skills and so on. I mean, do you feel like with your techniques you can help sort of, say, boost people's memory? And, and, if, and if brains are having trouble, maybe in later years, that they can sort of recover some yes. of their lost skills That was another, skills another, another question from the this box. This is a question from Michael here, yes. Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the, uh, the, me the memory thing interests me a lot, and uh, I, uh, I have various ongoing projects myself where I kind of use the memory techniques and I've written about them in, in one of the books and uh, um, and I think that memory is one of those things that yes we can do a huge amount to uh, and it's not not about improving the brain it's just about understanding how the memory works um, quite naturally the way we associate ideas and working with the way the brain works as opposed to learning things by rote, which is how we've sort of been taught since Victorian times and pre-Victorian times and this it goes right back to the ancient Greeks we we had better memories, we were, we were taught to, um, to memorize things using tricks of memory. Then that became very unfashionable in Victorian times. We don't know, we just got to learn things by rote, which is a very bad way of learning, very bad way of memorizing. Um, and it's a shame because we've missed out on things. And it was a suspicion because it was a suspicion of memory techniques because they'd sort of got tied in with, um, with the occult and there's a whole sort of uh, strange tradition that it went into. So they kind of, uh, they got forgotten about. Um, and I think they're fascinating. So uh, they're not new ideas. But yeah, and you can look on books and books, any number of books on memory techniques, or indeed my own uh, book has a chapter on it. Not this one, it's the Tricks of the Mind book. Um, and yes, I think there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of untapped potential there. At the same time, what I do is entertainment, so I'm, I'm careful just to kind of not step too much into that area of kind of, um, because people do ask for help. I think the moment you're on TV, people start asking for help, let alone if you're doing what I'm, what I'm doing. And I have, to, I have to just always say thank you, but I, I can't, and it's not appropriate for me to get involved, because you know, it, it isn't, um, even if it really looks like it is, it isn't, because if you, you, know, if you have something that needs uh, attention or dealing with in some way, you want to see somebody who spends their life, and it is their job to deal with that thing, not somebody who's on TV um, entertaining people who may or may not have an interest in that area. So. Um, so yes, I don't get involved, but the, from a, the, the memory thing, yeah, I do find very interesting. And yeah, because your, tricks, your tricks of the Mind book has, has got a long um, suggested reading list as well at the back. Yeah, yeah, for that reason, yes, to hopefully push people in, into those areas, yeah.